we're here to learn with and from each other and create community. So while I'll be taking the open forum questions today, and by the way, you all submitted over 100 questions. Yes, you heard me correctly. <laughs> I will try to address as many as I can. Um, but I also believe that we can learn from each other. And so there's gonna be opportunities where I will pivot and I will open it up and I will ask anyone else to share and contribute and add to the discussion. Although topics vary from week to week with our intentional conversations, what connects all of these sessions is the common thread of the intersection of diversity, equity, and inclusion, leadership, and business. Certainly want to respect what's top of mind for all as we continue to navigate um, this global pandemic, as well as while we are amidst the racial injustice crisis um, that we all are being impacted by. So see this as a path to action through um, application rather than just transferring knowledge. This is a way to share information, dynamic knowledge that helps us to lead inclusively. Again, I want you to leverage that chat room for introducing yourself, share your LinkedIn connection if you'd like, share any links to resources, ask your questions. This is about community. This session is being recorded and it will be shared this afternoon along with the chat room transcript. So now that that's all out of the way, I'm going to ask Anna to go ahead and close out sharing of the screen and um, we're going to dive right in. We're going to dive right in and I hope that you will um, bear with me as this has been full transparency. It's been, a, it's been a hard week. It's been a hard week from the perspective of um, as DEI practitioners all over you know, the world are holding space for so many people right now to have these conversations and to feel safe, seen, heard, and valued. And that's a huge burden to carry. I've been doing a number of safe space conversations and um, I have, I've had my moments where I had to um, redirect my attention in other areas just to um, take care of self and to be prepared to get back into the fight the next day. And so um, I share that in transparency because I want you all to also hold space for me as I try to be present with my emotions as I share. Um, but I, I, I know that there's a, a lot of um, emotional, um, you know, taxing feelings that have been surfacing just un, unpredicted. So anyway, I wanted to put that out there. So I'm just going to start um, reading some of the questions and I will address them. And um, again, as I see fit, I will open up the line and allow others to chime in as well. So the first question was, how can corporations really be diverse and inclusive when their operations were never built to empower all sections of society. And then um, the person referenced the book, The New Confessions of an Economic Hitman. So I, have, I am not familiar with that book, but I do want to do my best to try to address the question of how corporations can be diverse and inclusive when their operations were never built to empower all sections of society. So I think it's important for us to realize that uh, while we may feel paralyzed and stuck, I think that that is probably what keeps us stuck sometimes. So we're gonna to have to really identify our mindset around um, instilling hope and believing that we can change outcomes that have been in place for a very long time. And so um, to me, what that looks like is we have to believe that we can dismantle the systems that we're meant to oppress. Because if we don't believe that, we're not gonna be in the fight. Our heart's not gonna be in it. Our mind's not gonna be in it. We're not gonna be leading with the level of intellect and strategic um, thought leadership to help us get to those solutions. And so let's believe that we can rebuild, we can reimagine the operations of these organizations that have not thought intently about diversity, equity, and inclusion. I think the first step to getting to that place, though, is, um, you know, getting organizational leaders to be convinced of such, that, that, that they need to be mindful about dismantling um, the operations that have existed so long to keep certain people oppressed. And I find that data is really critical for helping people to get on board. We can't argue with facts, right? And so I always say, let's make sure as we're doing this work, even though it can be very emotional, let's lead with intellect, bring the facts to the table. Let them see the results um, and the reality of those results. And then that will at least allow you greater propensity to be able to educate, to influence those individuals. Okay, next question. The recent behavior, and by the way, Jared just posted in chat uh, about the book. So apparently Jared is familiar with the book, The New Confessions of an Economic Hitman. And so maybe you can add some additional commentary into the, um, the chat room. And again, Jalitha just said, can you repeat the title? Um, it's The New Confessions of an Economic Hitman. And if you know the author, Jared, please put that in the chat for us. Okay, so the next question. 
The recent behavior of Central Park showcases the weaponization of race and brings a voice to other underlying concern in the workplace. Because Amy Cooper worked for a large corporate investment firm, people are now asking how she may have also weaponized race in similar ways to prevent the advancement of people of color because of her position. How would you address that point? By the way, you all went really deep and I'm glad that you feel safe to not be surface. <laughs> um, so here's what I will say about that. You know, we have to listen that there's an Amy Cooper in most organizations. Um, as unfortunate as it is, that is the case. Um, Amy Cooper was just caught. She didn't think that she would be, but she was. These types of personalities, they know how to exist in corporate spaces and to socialize accordingly to what society tolerates, right? And so who you are at your core, I believe it will always find a way to surface. And um, in that regard, her situation, it, it showed up. It showed up in a moment where she didn't think that eyes were on her and that eyes would be on her. I wasn't surprised by the Amy Cooper um, situation. Um, this is why this conversation of racial injustice is so important and particularly it's important to realize that it's not just about the blatant behaviors that sometimes we encounter and witness but it's also equally about the subtleties of the microaggressions and all the nuances that exist around how people um, will, will, will engage in behaviors that are oppressive and so we have to illuminate that and and I think that's why at least for me and many other DEI practitioners the conversation around what's happening now with the protest and the unrest and, and the recent you know, atrocities of, of, of the deaths that we have experienced from those in the Black community, that is just a byproduct of a much deeper systemic um, issue that has been prevalent for 400 plus years. So it just looks a little different right now. And so the same way that those attitudes and behaviors have been evolving to where we have the Amy Coopers doing what Amy Coopers do, we have to realize we have to be just as smart and, and just as vigilant and um, attacking and dismantling those types of behaviors. And so it is, I, I think that the, the, the term, you know, weaponization, I, that was appropriate use of language there. And I think that we have to just be mindful that it's, it's, it's nuanced as well. Racism is also nuanced as well as it is blatant. Okay, how, and I probably bet that many of us have an Amy Cooper story so I'm gonna do this. If you have an Amy Cooper story or example, just put it into the chat and we're gonna find a way to come back to it in a little bit, okay? How do you think more consistent public vulnerability and authentic storytelling from high visible and influential leaders would change organizations to be more inclusive? So I am a big advocate of um, storytelling and the power of the narrative. I think that there's so much um, we can accomplish by getting people proximate to the issues, particularly the lived experiences of, of individuals that have been oppressed, have experienced you know, racism, if we hear those stories, and especially if those stories are coming from people that coexist in our world. So in our workplaces, you know, in our communities, in our neighborhoods, in, in some of the civic activities that we belong to. Um, the bottom line is that what we're experiencing right now is not a black issue. It is a humanity issue. And um, I think that stories are so powerful just for that. And so for me, I think that part of the vulnerability is um, getting people to lean in and into this courageous um, spirit whereby they're willing to share stories. And we have to create those spaces for people to be able to do that, where there's a great deal of safety, um, where there's a great deal of support. I have been holding a lot of these safe space conversations, as I mentioned, and they can get really, really heavy, but they are so impactful. I can't tell you the, the number of times that just this week, um, people have followed up by saying, I just never considered that perspective. I never knew that that activity or that behavior that I was engaging in was considered a microaggression. And now I know, so I'm better for it. And now I can be better going forward. And so we, we, have, to, we have to really create those opportunities for storytelling. I also will share that I think privilege is being able to hear about a problem and dismiss it or be passive about it simply because it doesn't personally affect us. And so um, when we hear those stories, it gives us permission to then reflect on our sources of privilege and power 
And then hopefully it will lead us to a place where we're thinking intently about how can I use and leverage this, 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 this source of privilege and power to help someone else be successful and to help someone else um, be able to um, not have to experience some of the things that I know will directly impact me, but it impacts them and therefore it's a problem that I need to own as well. So that's what I will say about um, that question. Okay, the next question. How do we move beyond the initial inspiration and motivation to sustain meaningful change? Um, you all have heard me say this before if you've joined these conversations, but um, one of the things that I am telling everyone, black, white, other, everyone, is let's, let's be mindful of the power and the benefit of sitting with the pain of the discomfort that we all are experiencing right now. And I say that because as we're sitting with it, not that we're sitting idle, but we're being reflective, we're self-educating, and even we're helping others to become educated if we feel like we have that, um, that mental capacity to do that without it compromising us. Because the burden is definitely right now on a lot of the black community to, to do that education and, and, and we're exhausted. It's hard to, to do that. Um, but I think that if we work too quickly to get past this pain of discomfort and not let it permeate, it's going to prevent us, I believe, from, you know, based on the question, continuing to have that drive and that motivation to want to, with action, with useful action, be a part of the solution. And so I don't want to be here again. Let's not waste this crisis. Let's see it as an opportunity, because right now we need to be instilling hope as best as we can. So let's use it as an opportunity and become change agents rather than attempting to work to let that discomfort just pass us by too quickly. Um, and let me say this too, there are multiple ways to get into this fight. Um, you know, a lot of people have said, you know, I feel kind of guilty because I just haven't gone out there to protest. One of which is because, you know, we are in the midst of this global pandemic. Um, so I, I want to be careful about my own safety. But then I just, I don't know if that's the right thing to do. Is it really useful? Is it not? I don't know. I truly do believe in protesting. Um, I have not been out there um, as often as I would like to, but I have been out there. But I also believe that there's multiple ways to get into this fight. And we need to make sure that we give people permission to uh, understand what's going to work best for them. I think that people who are mentoring right now, people who are speaking out right now, people who are being allies, people who are donating to causes that help to break down um, oppressive behaviors and racism, all of that is being a part of the fight. So let's not pass judgment on how someone is fighting. Let's instead just make sure that we are helping people to, gra to gravitate towards the need to be in the fight. Because again, this is a humanity problem. I appreciate that question, by the way, whoever submitted it. Why should we extend grace and courtesy to individuals who are just now seeing that change is necessary despite being intelligent, savvy, and successful in every other part of their lives? Ugh. You know, what I'll say to that is, um, better late than never. You know, I think that we certainly could spend our energy being frustrated by the fact that it's taken so long for some people to realize that yes, racism does still exist. And we could, you know, put our energy into being upset by that. But I feel like let's use it as an opportunity. The reality is that even if people are coming to the conversation late, once they get in, they're in. And let's capitalize on that. We need as many collective voices around this as possible. And so let's not crucify those who are just now coming into some revelation around this. You know, we all respond to different things, different way that, that evolves our thinking, revolves our behavior and how in which we show up. And it just so happens that maybe for some people, seeing um, the results of, of black men, black women dying at the hands of police brutality is moving them to action. And so my take is, um, would I love for them to have been on board from day one? Yes, I would have loved to have my people avoid 400 years plus of what we are dealing with. But at the end of the day, right now, I want us to also be able to instill hope and instilling hope relies on us um, allowing people to come into the conversation, regardless of what point in time the revelations you know, occurred for them and to get busy at being a part of the fight. So let's be strategic and use those individuals to help us get to our end goal. Okay, so this is a question that's um, a little different. Um, are there courses offered in diversity, equity, and inclusion? Um, 
the answer to that is yes, absolutely. There's lots of, of educational opportunities um, for those who are interested in just on a personal level, helping to build their um, development around leading inclusively, or even for those who want to transition into this space from a professional career perspective. I will say that one of the silver lining around a lot of what's happened over the past you know, you know, few years, um, it has elevated this discipline to a place where I think that it has greater level of respect, um, this greater level of attention that's being placed on it. And I see all of that as incredibly positive. The conversations are changing, who's in the conversation is changing. Um, and so I, I, you know, the answer is yes, there are definitely lots of horses. If I had to think about some up top of my head, what comes to mind immediately would be that there are a number of um, diversity certification programs that people can go through. There's one at Cornell University. Um, I am a certified diversity executive through the Institute for Diversity Certification. Um, and that was a process similar to what a lot of HR professionals go through with um, SHRM. You know, you, you take a test, you go through classes, it could be self-study or you actually can go to classes, continue in education. Um, I also believe, because I'm based in South Carolina, many on the line are in South Carolina as well, that the University of South Carolina, they have um, a program as well. I know that it launched this year back in February. And so I would imagine they're going to continue to keep doing that. Howard University has a program as well around diversity um, leadership. And so resources abound. Um, the other thing that I will say too is for those who um, are interested in just, you know, some resources to help your own learning that, you know, self-education is so important right now, especially right now when the burden has been greatly placed on members of the black community to, um, to educate and that burden is really, really heavy to carry. Um, so I, I will say that there are tons of resources. I have even on my social media platforms recently posted um, anti-racism resources. I mean, there, there are so many out there. And so I encourage you to take a look at some of those. Okay, as a white person, how can I keep this dialogue going in circles and rooms where there are no people of color? Where do you find courage and opportunities to hold intentional conversations? And I actually combine those questions because I think that they are, um, are related. So someone put in the chat that Sai says something. I didn't get a chance to read it quickly, but I'm sighing a lot today because it, it really is, um, again, it's, it's me being very present with my emotions of, of all that I've been exposed to this week with the stories that I've been exposed to as people have been sharing. But my first thought, which is the reason for the sigh, is that, oh my goodness, it is such a place of privilege to be able to ask a question like that. It is. So... Um, but first, so, I, so with that point, I do want to acknowledge appreciation for the white allies that um, are greatly needed in this fight, that are, um, you know, finding appropriate ways to be useful in terms of holding space and, and bringing the conversation to the forefront and at tables um, that, that maybe, you know, Black individuals are not at. So one solution is to advocate to get us into those spaces. Um, I think that we need white allies just as concerned about the fact that the makeup and the C-suite levels at the you know, corporate board levels are not indicative of the talent, the rich talent of, of people of color. And um, instead of the voice being that of a, of a black person or a person of color bringing that to the surface, we need white people making those comments and bringing that to the surface. So one solution is advocate and be a voice for helping to get us into those spaces because it makes the conversation much more relevant when you're seated next to people who don't look like you in terms of being able to safely accommodate for them to be in that space confidently. So that's one thing. The other thing too is, as I mentioned before, there are multiple ways to get into the fight. Um, I think about sponsoring individuals in your workplace, making sure that they are being considered for high visible important assignments, um, making sure that you are mentoring them and coaching them, you're endorsing them and mentioning their names and conversations and rooms where they, they don't, they've never even been in, never even been invited to. Um, you know, the other thing that I will say is that I'm a big advocate of, of data. I think that data is king. You know, it's one thing to bring your experience, to bring your experience to a conversation or your opinions to a conversation, but I believe that people can't argue with facts. Oftentimes when I go in and I, I present to groups, you know, I, I, will, I will share what I have experienced directly, what I've seen as working with different clients, but 
what tends to really drill down to what resonates is when I can deliver facts. And so I would say as much as you can gather data on you know, the makeup of the organization, what other competitors or people in that industry are doing that helps them to have a competitive edge relevant to diversity, equity, and inclusion, bring all of that to the table. Challenge the status quo, um, but don't be afraid to lead with courage and find and create those opportunities to have these types of conversations. It's not easy, it's difficult, it's complex, but you're gonna have to ask the tough questions and leverage the power and the influence that you have to lean into those topics and those white spaces. Um, because many of, of you who are in those spaces, you already, you have their ear. You have the ear of those that have the ability to, to change, um, you know, things about the, the environment that could be leading to lack of um, equitable opportunities for all. So. Great question, thank you. What strategies can we implement to ensure the younger generation has tools to navigate the diversity and inclusion landscape? And I'm gonna combine that with another question that came in as well, and I'll read this question. I am in education. My teachers are requesting professional development and how to best support their students, understand anti-racism, and have social emotional support following COVID as well. What is the best way to implement support in the classroom? especially for those new to this work so that we don't misstep in our ignorance. What is the best way to provide professional development for our predominantly white faculty? So this relates to education. I am, I'm glad that there are individuals who are amplifying the need to not just have this conversation at adult tables, but um, we need to start this conversation with the young people much sooner than what I've seen in the past. I am always so thrilled when um, you know higher learning institutions or even K through 12 um, schools will reach out to invite me to come speak and share with their staff, their faculty, or even with their students. And, and I have to give a shout out to um, Mr. William Brown, who's who's on this call joining today with Legacy Early College. Um, I have done sessions for them on multiple occasions and continue to work with them. But that's important. We can't assume that people understand what these constructs are: diversity, equity, and inclusion in theory or in practice. And so we have to make sure that we are providing the training and the education. And, um, and I remember one day I was facilitating a session with a group of, of, of teachers, of educators. And this one um, Caucasian woman, she shared a story about how she is so committed to her students and she has such a heart for really wanting her students that are underprivileged, they are from low income families to get it. So she puts a lot of effort into really giving attention to those students. And um, she, she admittedly shared that in her well-meaning um, position, she wants to try to hold space for those students and be there for them. She finally pulled, I'll say little Johnny, little Johnny aside one day, African-American boy and said, I don't get it. I've given you all this extra time. I've worked with you on this. Why do you still keep coming in without your homework? What is it? And she admitted that she was really at a place of frustration as she was talking to little Johnny. And little Johnny broke in tears. And he said to her, Miss So-and-so, last night, I had to take my little sister. And we had to hide at the neighbors because my mom was being abused. And in that moment, she was overcome with emotion just sharing the story. But what she was revealing is that I'm an educator and I was focused so much on my craft and my trade and what I'm doing to reach that child that I completely did not take into account that my privilege did not allow me to see that little Johnny had needs that go beyond just a textbook type situation. And it completely opened up her eyes. And so I share that story just to say that we cannot understate the importance of really getting our educators, our administrators to understand that their job is not only to get little Johnny, little Sally to learn the ABCs, the one, two, threes, but they have to have greater context of what those experiences are in order to be able to reach them for them to be successful. And I think similar scenarios could apply even to the business world in terms of how in which oftentimes we we, we operate business as usual without really taking the time to understand what are the lived experiences of these individuals that we cannot fully empathize with because we've never been in that situation. But we can't dismiss it. We have to make sure we lean into that. So I, I appreciate that question. Our young people are more woke than we probably believe. In fact, a lot of times when I'm looking out and I'm seeing the pictures of, of the protests, there are those young people. And it, um, 
it, it's inspiring. It's inspiring to know that the younger generations are, um, they, they get it. And they are even helping to educate their parents and, and, and you know, other members of their family. So that's great. Okay. How do you address those who refuse to listen to common sense when it comes to race relations? My answer is you don't. And this is my philosophy. Uh, maybe others have a different per take on this, but for me, I feel like after the first few well-meaning attempts, once you realize that you're not gonna get through to a person, I feel like my time is better spent and my energy is better spent on trying to bridge that gap and engage others that I feel like have greater propensity to be able to understand and engage in a way. Um, when I wrote my first book, The Intentional Inclusionist, one of the things that I said often is that the audience was not for those who are you know, racist, practicing you know, bigotry. I, I was not targeting those individuals. I was targeting the folks that were passive about the work of diversity, equity, and inclusion. They, they could acknowledge it, they could believe there was value in it, but they were sitting on the sidelines, seeing it as the responsibility of someone else. And most often that someone else was maybe the HR person or maybe the chief diversity officer, um, or even maybe the, the people that are part of those underrepresented populations, right? And they were passive. And so my message was, I think that an opportunity for us is to really appeal to those individuals who are sitting on the sidelines, who understand the value, but they're just not engaging directly because they're not owning it. And to get them to see that it's part of their responsibility to be in the mix as well. I'm watching the time here. And so that has been my position all along. If you feel like you can build relationships with people to where you can eventually win them over, then keep trying. But for me, I'd rather put my energy and time towards where I feel like there's, there's greater opportunity. Um, I think that helps us to build critical mass of people that are in this space. And that's important because we need to move with speed and power right now. And in order to do that, we need as many people at the table. So that's my take. What was the most difficult conversation you had with the client about DEI? <laughs> Let me see which one I, I can share here. Um, so I am one of those DEI practitioners. I really believe in getting to the crux of the matter. I believe in peeling back all the layers and dealing with the root cause of issues. Um, and I value that, I value that. I value impact over activity. And so if I am engaging with you in a client consultant capacity and I'm, I'm understanding your needs, your challenges, and I start to you know, provide a path forward for, um, for correction or for um, just enhanced um, approach to diversity, equity, and inclusion, if I see that it's more about compliance for you and that even through my efforts to try to guide you in direction that leads to sustainable outcomes, if I can't move the needle there, then I, I am pretty vocal and forthcoming about sharing that I may not be the best alignment in terms of a partner as a resource. And, and that can be a difficult conversation sometimes. But it's also so empowering and it's so fulfilling. And I will tell you that when I first launched my DEI consulting business, um, I was not as comfortable with that because, you know, these conversations also about intersecting business and entrepreneurship. And as an entrepreneur, I knew that I am potentially now turning away revenue. Um, but I, I had to be true to my convictions. And so I finally got to the point to where I, my business was able to be um, selective about the clients that I would say yes and I would say no to. And a lot of the evaluation and assessing that has everything to do with, um, is this client after activity or after impact? And I am I'm pretty un unapologetic about that. Now, having said that, I realize that everyone has a starting place. So it's not about judging that you haven't done anything in the past and oh, you're just not getting into the game. It's more about the attitude, right? And the mental capacity to, to really commit to the work that's required. And I feel like I have a really good um, radar for being able to, um, to, 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 to discern that as I'm talking with people. Okay, so there's multiple questions left, but here's what I wanna do right now before I take any other questions. I want to pause, because I have addressed a number of questions and I've shared my perspective. I wanna just open up the line right now and get anyone who wishes to, to comment or share or speak or add some additional insight to some of the responses that I have provided. Because again, while I am in this space, I'm passionate about it, I'm learning every day along with each of you and I feel like we really can learn with and from each other. So let me just take a moment 
to allow anyone, if you so feel compelled, to unmute yourself and share a comment or um, and contribute to the conversations that I've added so far. And it can be about any of the discussions we've had. Hey, Nika. Hi. I always feel like I'm the first one to say something, so. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Angela. No, not, get us started. I appreciate you for that. <laughs> um, there's actually two things I want to comment on. Um, I, I think that was my question that you asked about um, Amy Cooper and the weaponization of race. I think that was the one I sent in. And I talked to my mom about this because, you know, I'm trying to get um, more of a perspective. My mom is that baby boomer generation and I have some younger cousins who are um, in the millennials and then me and Gen X. And so I've been trying to see what it's been like over time. And, and so I asked her because my mom was one of the first African-American chemists to be, to be hired at Dow Chemicals in DC back in the 60s. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to know if she was experiencing some of those same things back then. And she was like, oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, but even so further back, when you talk about weaponization of race and my dad was one of the first African-Americans to integrate poly technical high school in Baltimore, Maryland. And that was three years before Brown versus the Board of Education. So my dad would tell me stories about how he had to take the admittance test four times. Mm -hmm. And the first time he scored um, a perfect score and they didn't believe him. So they sat him in a circle of people and he had to take it three more times in order to be admitted. And you see that on the job in so many ways because someone will say, and you know a person, you have interactions with somebody and you know this person and somebody will say about this person, you know, they just aren't a right, the, a right fit for this. They just don't seem to be in the right place to be able to handle the management experience or they haven't had enough time on the job or um, they haven't, their degree is not in this field. And how many times are we employed in jobs where that's not our degree, but there are still intangible and other tangible assets that make us an excellent candidate for that job. But um, it just having had those experiences and realizing that they're happening now, they have happened in the past and that they are still happening and to see it put to light is something just really disheartening and cautionary, but it's also inspiring because you want to prove people wrong uh, yeah yeah you're right angela and i think that a lot of people are um having to navigate these mixed emotions i mean like in in one hour i have gone from one extreme to the next you know um because yeah i think that hearing these stories for some of us it ignites this this fire of we gotta do something fast now i'm inspired i'm empowered i'm gonna go and do something right and then others and they leave us paralyzed to where we're like is there can anything be done to kind of change the outcome? But a couple of things that you mentioned that I wanted to just comment on. The first is, um, first, thank you for your question. And you mentioned the word fit. And I'm seeing some chatter in the, in the comments um, in the chat room as well about this. Um, so oftentimes when I share with audiences, I will impress upon them the consideration of banding the word fit from hiring and promotion conversations. And the reason why is because there's nothing in and of itself wrong with the word fit. But if we think about how we are conditioned to consider when someone says they're not a good fit, really sometimes consciously and unconsciously, what they're alluding to is they don't look like us. They don't act like us. They don't behave like us. And so if you ban the word fit from those hiring and promotion conversations, it forces those hiring managers to be much more thoughtful and articulate about from a qualification standpoint, how does this person or this candidate um, fare over another individual? And so I think that's just an important practice that I wanted to throw out there. The other thing that you said was your story is, is one about your dad that I think rings true for so many people. One of the biggest frustrations that uh, I hear people of color um, encounter um, 
frequently is that their lived experiences are not believed, which they don't even like coming forward to share if this was my experience, you know, hey, supervisor, hey, manager, hey, whoever that I'm thinking can help me. I'm going to share this experience with you. Sometimes people won't even do that. So they'll just mask, they'll cover, they'll just harbor those feelings, which leads to them not being productive, them not being able to show up as their authentic selves. And there's a whole myriad of, of implications of that, right? But it's, it's, it's certainly a place of privilege to be believed these days in the workplace about your experience, you know? And I, I don't want to understate that. I, I believe that all of us have areas of privilege in our lives. I think that sometimes the reason that the conversation around privilege gets um, it shuts down so many people is because we, we don't talk about it in a broad context. And I think there's times to talk about it in a broad context. And there's also times to talk about it specifically as white privilege. But the point that I want to make here is that if we all were to take inventory of our lives, um, I think that we probably all can find some element of privilege. Um, I always talk about the fact that as a black female, I grew up in a home with two parents. I grew up in a home where I had more than enough. Um, I'm a well able body individual. All of those things have nothing at all to do with anything that I did. Those were the cards and the hand that I was dealt, right? And so what's important is to acknowledge those privileges and find ways to use them as influence and power to help someone else along the way be, be successful and helpful. So um, it's just, it's a place of privilege to be believed. And so if we want to start doing something just on a small micro level, let's just start believing the lived experiences of people of color when they bring forth those experiences, validate their thoughts and their feelings, right? Um, they want to be seen, valued, and heard. Sounds like someone wants to chime in, or am I making that up? Did I just hear something? I actually do want to put back on something that you said. Um, there are times when, and I know that, you know, people will tell you, and having worked in HR, I know this myself, that you need to cater your resume in order to um, apply for, for whatever job you're applying, because every, every position is different. Um, but there are times when I have deliberately left experiences for skills or attributes because what I was first experiencing when I came back from Europe was I was, oh, you're, but you're so overqualified. Why would you want to do this? And so I, I deliberately started leaving things off in order to be a part or considered for right. a position as opposed right. to sharing the breadth of my experiences, not yeah. telling people how many places I've traveled, not yeah. letting them know how many languages I speak, because if you do, then you're shuffled into another category. Sure, no, thank you, that's, that's good intel. And yeah, a lot of us, that's what we do as we're going in for jobs, we don't just um, share everything about ourselves, particularly the affiliations, right? Um, because if, I, if I'm a person that's just coming out of college and I say that I was the president of African American Leadership Greenville or whatever it is, people are going to know what my race is. And, you know, and certainly there's been studies and resources that support that there's bias and who you call in for interviews and things of that nature. So thank you. And I see that Keenan McBride has yes. raised. And so um, please, Keenan, step in and share your comments right now. Very quickly, um, I, the comments actually made me think about my own experience. Um, I actually worked for a firm that um, um, I was the, um, in the head of the training department there at, at this facility, this place, and um, my HR director, uh, my training manager, my direct manager actually left the company, and my HR director was um, in the process of trying to promote me into this uh, position of the, the, the manager for their the training area, and um, lo and behold, he left. Um, but the promotions that he had made for me um, slowly started to be taken away again. However, the responsibility for myself wasn't taken away. I actually ran the um, training department at this facility for the better part of two years um, as the training manager without the official promotion, without the pay, without the benefits, without anything else, but I did direct i did do the budgets i i i was uh, responsible for the team and everything in that same nature but i actually was also responsible for interviewing people for the training manager position who had less credentials i say in educational than i had um for that same 
role. But, you know, I, I said to myself, I had to look at it two different ways. I had to look at it either, okay, I could either take this and raise a big thing, make it, you know, a sense of being bitter for me, or I took it as an opportunity since I had control of the training budget and everything like that developed me and my team with further tools. And so that eventually got me to the point to where once they did decide to hire someone else and they eliminated several positions, um, I was one of those positions that was eliminated, but that's fine. By that time, I had gained enough education and to be able to start my own business doing and working with vendors and doing what I wanted to do in the first place. But that's just an example of the institutional um, style of biases and racism that I think exists because like I said, I managed the department for the better part of two years, but for some reason I, you know, was never really afforded the opportunity. I will interview you. We're going to let you interview for this position, but then we decide not to. And so, you know, that's just my experience there in that platform. And it just seemed to fit with everything you guys were talking about. No, thank you, Keenan. It definitely resonates. I'm sorry that was your experience, but I'm also excited because it led to, it sounds like a greater opportunity um, for entrepreneurship. And, you know, not all of us are wired to weather the storm, to be that trailblazer, to be the one that challenges the status quo and to speak up. I totally get that. Um, and so what I like about what you shared is that in your situation, your approach was strategic, you know? This is the situation, unfortunate as it is, but I'm gonna to try to leverage this to my benefit. And I think there's multiple ways for us to self-advocate. Um, I think that another approach, if you're in, feel emboldened enough to do this, is to speak up for yourself. Sometimes when I go into spaces, particularly if I'm presenting to a, um, a diverse audience or of, of multicultural leaders, I will, I will help them to realize that there's power in them self-advocating. Sometimes, um, we, we assume that if we just do our work and do good at it, that the opportunities are going to come to us. That's not always the case. In fact, I'm finding for a lot of people of color, that tends to more often than not um, be the case. And so, but we have to be vocal about what it is that we want. What is our career trajectory goals and plans that we want within this organization? And be bold enough to communicate that. Find mentors and sponsors that can help us to, to, to navigate those type conversations appropriately. Because otherwise, it's just too easy for someone to say, well, I didn't know that you wanted it, you know? And so I'm definitely not, re you know, releasing uh, the, um, the responsibility of the leadership in this particular, you know, example, but I feel like there's some things that can happen on both ends that helps us to get to the, the end goal that we're seeking. Okay, are there any other comments at this juncture based on what we've talked about so far? Yes, I'd like to say Hi. something. Hi. Hi, Mia. Uh, how are you? Um, you know, one of the things I've experienced in, in going through all of this, and one of the things you said, you know, it's really about when people kind of become awake to um, what's going on. And I wrote an article, article this week about allyship versus fad. Um, you know, is this genuine allyship? Is this something that because I, that is one of the things I definitely, definitely um, you know, advocate for because the advancement is not going to happen without the unity and the collaboration that we need to move, um, you know, forward with race relations. But it's also one of these things where I think we're bombarded with seeing all of these corporate messages and all these letters coming out from CEOs and stuff like that. But, you know, I did go through this back and forth in one of my um, groups that I'm on in Facebook. And my real question was, I get the outrage at watching the video. I get the outrage at seeing all these protests, but is there outrage when these CEOs go and sit at their tables and do not see any diversity? And because you can put that statement out there and it looks great and did you even write it and you know then you go into your you know it's out there you're getting accolades you're getting likes you're getting the thumbs up but then you go to your executive meeting on monday and you sit down with your team of no diversity so it's like 
it, it's really about is this allyship or is this everybody's putting out a letter so I need to put out a letter and is it the pressure or are you really putting it out because there is a genuine concern and yes now you have um, you know lack of a better word you're woke and you're down for the cause um, but ultimately how long is that going to last when a new wave of the coronavirus takes place and that takes over media how long is that going to last once these elections come up and now that's in the media and this isn't so popular right now you know where does that leave you know this excitement that you've kind of put in your employees of color in the workplace oh now they get it but now it's coronavirus that's popular now it's the elections that are popular so i just um i just wanted to share that well i'm so glad you did share there's so much to unpack with your commentary and it's it's spot on um you know I, first of all i love the title of the article so i'm hoping that perhaps you'll be willing to share a link to it maybe in our chat so this community can sure. have access to it i think you said allyship versus bad so i, I like that um and there's a lot of talk about um you know, allyship versus accomplice and, and really trying to get people to understand the essence of true and meaningful allyship. You know, the bare minimum is action. So you can't assign yourself the label of an ally without being willing to put in some type of work. And it's not just any kind of work because otherwise it can be perceived as performative, you know, just looking to get credit and getting recognized for being on the right side. Um, but it needs to be useful. And I think that the best way to ensure that your help and your offering to stay in the solidarity is useful is ask that question. And don't walk away without really um, being, helping the person to be thoughtful and be specific back to you. So that's one thing. The other thing I'll say about these, these statements and these letters, because I know that we all are being inundated with them. And let me just say right now, bless all of the DEI practitioners around the world because their phones are ringing off the hook, their days are long. It is, it is it's a big burden to carry right now. It is to help organizations to navigate the complexities of this, but it's also proving our work. And so I, I'm grateful for that. But what I will say about statements, I've said to so many clients of late that there's no such thing as a perfect statement. Certainly there are um, best practices that have bubbled up into conversations you know, with other DEI mastermind groups about what makes it um, resonate, um, but there's not really a perfect statement because a statement in and of itself is just one touch point. You know, you have to look at the history of the organization and then more importantly, you have to also think about what's ahead, what happens after the statement. And so what I have been encouraging organizations to do is if you're going to release a statement, and I do believe that organizations should not sit silent, you know, I even think that there's value in organizations being unassuming about what they don't know because none of us has this figured out right now. So I've even appreciated statements where I've heard people say, we don't know how to fix this, but we're committed to doing X, Y, Z to help get towards the path of being a part of the solution. We're not going to sit silent. And that in and of itself is, is really powerful. But um, it, it's what happens after the fact. And I think that you know, America right now, we are, we're criticizing organizations, we're scrutinizing their statements, their actions. And so, um, you know, I heard someone say the other day, I feel like I can't win for losing. I don't want to just put something out there from an organization perspective, because if it's, if it rings hollow, or if it seems, you know, disingenuous, then we're going to, you know, of course be criticized. But if I don't do anything, they're going to say, you don't care at all. You're not woke and I'll be criticized. And so I understand the complexity that a lot of leaders are going through. But I am, I am sharing with everyone, do not sit silent, have a voice. Even if your voice is saying right now, I'm gonna come back to you in another week or so. Right now, I don't know, but I stand with the black community and I denounce any signs and any spaces where racism is being tolerated. So I hear you, I hear you. I look forward to reading your article. Thank you for sharing. One of the questions I've been asking in the um, safe space sharing is for people to just articulate and share um, a defining moment where they became wake to racism. And that has been really, really interesting. I think I saw this question actually on a post on LinkedIn and I thought, gosh, it's such a thought provoking question. And the responses are really rich. And so if you're having some just sidebar conversations with people, 
um, again, just in your desire to learn with, learn from, and, and then get other perspectives, that is a great question, I believe, to engage people on. You know, what is a defining moment that caused you to be wake to racism, you know? Okay, any other thoughts or comments anyone would like to share at this time? Please feel free to unmute yourself to do so. Okay, let me check the time. Okay, yes, we are at time. Oh my gosh, the hour always goes by so fast. So I'm gonna keep these questions because I feel like this is not going to be the last time. This will be treated as an open forum. I hope you found this helpful. Um, I know that I always gain so much by just being connected to, to this audience. Uh, we'll be back here again next week. Look forward to having Kanika Tolber. As I mentioned before, you'll get an email this afternoon with a recap of the, the transcript from the chat room, as well as um, the recording. Um, let's just continue to stay in the fight. And as you continue to hold space for others and to find how you want to be a part of, of the Path Forward plan, I just, I want you to also find opportunities to, to help identify where we can instill hope in people, because I don't want people to lose hope, right? Even as we sit with this discomfort, that can be really, really heavy and cause us to lose hope. Um, so we have, to, we have to really balance the two. But I believe we're going to emerge stronger from this. I believe that no crisis has ever been wasted. And, uh, and I want us all to just, just lean into that. Lean into your vulnerabilities, um, create opportunities where you can to just be a part of the conversation. Thank you all, we'll see you next week. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, Dr. Nika. Take care, keep up the great work. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Thank you, Nika. Thank you, thanks so much. Good to see you, thanks for joining. Absolutely. Thank you for your work. It's awesome. I appreciate it, Jackie. Thank you. Thank you so You're much. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Hi, Ms. Glenda Morrison Fair. How are you? Sorry, I was late. I underestimated my walk this morning. Oh, it's quite all right. I don't think I realized what time you joined, but thank you. I think I've seen your name several times come through on these calls, and so thank you. I appreciate that. I did put a comment in the uh, chat room. What happens after the statement is something that we all need to consider. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the most important focus right now. <laughs> what absolutely. happens after the statement? The yeah, statement. yeah. You, you've actually given me a title for my next blog. <laughs> <laughs> what Thank happens you. after the statement? <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you all so much. Thanks.